how the tech are you? Uh, if you're, you're seeing this, then we didn't delete the video this time and actually got <laughs> it out. <laughs> Oops. Bit of a, bit of an issue last week, but we're back. Uh, and if you're wondering what this is, this is our weekly tech show for Echoplex Media. We talk about tech news and science news and pretty much anything tech and science related that we feel like talking about. I am historian Matt. I usually talk about science and tech news specifically. Um, yeah, but uh, let's see. This week, I think it's all tech stuff this time. So kind of uh, a little bit of old stuff that came from last week that uh, we're, we're covering again because it's important and it's evergreen kind of stuff. So uh, my first story is the merge is coming. What is the merge? What am I talking about? I'll get to that later. And then my second topic is streaming wins. And again, talk about that later in my segment on what exactly I'm talking about. So uh, let's see, the guy with the pink mic. How's it going? I am HK Perrin, and I am a software engineer, so I mostly talk about software engineering news. Uh, one big thing that relates to both users and engineers that happened a couple weeks ago is Android 13 came out. Uh, you probably don't have it yet unless you have a Pixel phone. So uh, I'm going to talk about what Android 13 brings to the table. Uh, and my second story is not something that happened recently, but something I thought was cool. And I thought you guys would want to know it too. In 2015, the HTTP spec was extended with a new status code. And I'm going to talk about that in my segment. Uh, over to you, Dave. Hi, I'm Dave. I'm not a software engineer. I'm the producer of this show and the producer of all the shows on this uh, channel. And I'm going to talk about uh, Janet Jackson and uh, e-bikes this week. And uh, Matt, take it away. All right. So my first story for the night, the merge is coming. What is the merge? What am I talking about? I'm talking about Ethereum's merge, the merge with proof of stake. So um, in a few weeks, Ethereum will merge in the proof of stake network and uh start uh, using that new form of um you know securing their network this will reduce ethereum's energy consumption by a factor of about a thousand it's a it's a pretty good amount maybe a little bit more than that Jeez. but uh huge difference in energy consumption this is a going to be a big uh big deal but after the successful test on august 10th the merge is scheduled for the for mid-september the exact date is not clear. It is based on, as most um, updates for, for cryptocurrencies, it's based on block number, not a specific date. And though they generally take the same amount of time to make blocks, you know, usually um, depending on which one it's 10 minutes or something. I don't remember what the Ethereum's is. I think it's shorter than 10 minutes. But... Um, that it's supposed to give like a specific time, but sometimes it takes a less time. Sometimes it takes a little more time to create a block. So even though they aimed it for some time in mid September, they don't know exactly when it'll go through, but it is a specific uh, block number. And then everybody will switch over at the same time to the new proof of stake version. Uh, so what proof of stake does, well, I should talk about what Ethereum is currently doing. Ethereum is uh, currently proof of work, which basically means to create blocks, which is part of the, the process of securing the network for Ethereum and, make, and basically validating transactions and stuff. The people who are called miners, have to solve this big problem or a it's not really solving a problem per se. It's finding a particular solution, um, which they try to based on the amount of total number of uh, amount of computing power going at it. They, they try to make it take a certain amount of time to do, but um, yeah. So right now a bunch of people, a bunch of people called miners with, GPUs basically try to solve this problem as fast as they can or find the solution as fast as they can. Uh, and um, that ends up using a lot of power 
And it's a big, uh, it's a big complaint about cryptocurrencies in general, this proof of work, because transactions now are, you know, use a lot more energy than other forms of using, you know, passing value uh, over the internet or otherwise over network or something. So for example, Visa and your credit card transactions use a whole lot less power per transaction. And this is becoming a big problem as things like Bitcoin, which is the biggest of the cryptocurrencies at the moment, biggest network is, you know, uses power of not even small nations anymore. It's actually kind of same size, same as, uh, first world uh, industrialized nations now, some of them, not all of them. And uh, it's uh, people trying to find alternatives. So the proof of stake is instead of solving these problems or finding a solution as as quickly as possible uh, for, for this hard problem, proof of stake is anybody who has enough ether, which is the coin that, that Ethereum uses can stake this ether. And then they are able to, through a complicated method are able to, um, help secure the network. And exactly how that works is a little bit complicated. It's not just that you're staking. There's some randomness involved that don't fully understand and didn't have time to go over and memorize again. But the idea is instead of using GPUs, you can actually just stake ether stake your coins and for doing that for staking your coins and helping secure the the network you also can get a small return they'll they'll give you ether for um uh each block or or something i don't remember exactly how often it it happens but you basically get a, a, a simple return on your staking so um it's expected since we're not act you don't actually have to run these big honking machines to, to mine anymore. And instead it's just putting ether in a certain place, basically, then people will, uh, or the whole network will use quite a bit less electricity yet still be just as secure. Um, so Ethereum, and I guess the other thing is Ethereum right now, uh, has a certain, um, pro the, the, algorithm it uses for securing its network as proof of work uses GPUs. And I mentioned Bitcoin, Bitcoin actually doesn't use GPUs. It has a different kind of algorithm and it uses ASICs, which is application specific integrated circuits. And they are more energy efficient, which is good, but because the network is so big, it doesn't really matter because (laughs) they still use quite a bit more energy. But um, if Ethereum, if proof of stake works for Ethereum, it may go to Bitcoin, although there's a lot of, that's, that's really up in the air. I'll have to see what happens. But if Ethereum does get off of uh, proof of work, there may be a lot of GPUs on the market in the future. So uh, any questions? Um, I had a question. Does staking ether mean that you can't use it yes and no it's okay um you can put staked ether so i think you have to stake 32 ether which is not a small amount of money it's um i think it's like forty thousand dollars around that right now uh it was a little more while ago when the price was higher but um so you you basically put this ether in a particular um what is it called? Uh, address, I think. And you have to leave it there and for long enough that the blocks churn and you start getting a return. I think, however, Coinbase has started a uh, something like a wrapped Ether thing, or a wrapped stake, staked Ether, if that makes any sense, um, which yeah. is basically a way of taking something you're you're, it's not the actual coins, right? But you're saying that you have access to this thing at some point and you can pull it out. Uh, but okay. it's almost like having a pointer kind of. So <laughs> they stake coins. their coins and you basically buy into that stake for a yeah, portion so of the Yeah, so it's like return. a coin that can be traded based yeah. on, or derivative, as they would call it, 
based on some staked ether. So you can kind of still use it because using this wrapped staked ether thing, but um, okay. it hasn't really been picked up because really the staking hasn't really started yet. People are able to stake coins, but they don't think they're getting a return quite yet. Okay. But the, the owner of the coin that's staked can't use it as long as it's staked, right? Correct. Okay. And then I yeah. had a question. How are new Ether generated under the system then? Uh, I believe they're generated pretty much the same way as the old system um, in that people who are, have their Ether staked, they'll actually, this return that they get, this percent of whatever they have staked, is actually not a percent, it's just what is returned. Some of it is new Ether that's being created, and it's created on a particular schedule, and I believe that is distributed I don't think it's distributed to everybody who has stake. I think it's like randomly some people who have their coins staked are picked and then they get the coins, but then they have to actually secure the transactions. Hard to explain. Hmm. Um, I think that's how that works, but it's not just the new ether that they get as a return. They also get all of the transaction fees for the network. Hmm. Uh, so combined and then... All, all the transaction fees combined and any new ether that's created are all put together in kind of a pool. And then that's distributed to everybody who not only has their ether staked, but were picked for this block round. And then there's some okay. probability that you're going to get picked per round for and uh, if, staking, I believe is how it works. If you have staked ether, would you then need to calculate hashes to add new blocks or else like who adds new blocks to the chain? Um, they are the ones, the stakers are the ones that are adding new blocks to the chain. I don't know if they're actually doing new hashes or not. That's one, one of the things I need to look into because, yeah, you do need to have a hash for to actually like create a block, to create a, a block chain, uh, to chain them together. But, I, but probably what's happening is you're creating the hash, but it's uh, not as... You don't need to hit a certain number of like zeros at the end or something. So yeah, it's not I think that's what's happening to, to hash, which is how they control the difficulty of of a, a hash for the proof of work uh, yeah. versions. So I think this is basically like you have to get maybe like one zero or something just to prove that it's or not even that, just create it, <laughs> just create a hash for it, and everybody yeah, agrees what's you, in the block. That, that might be what, own, what's happening. If you own your staked ether, you could probably just put something that proves that. This is coming from you. This block yeah. is coming from you. Something like yeah. it's digitally signed or something. Right. So I have not looked like deeply into how that works and I haven't had, uh, I haven't found good explanations. Maybe the next show, if I can find that, I'll talk about that more deeply. Um, it occurs okay. to me. And I, I know that like maybe a lot of the people that are listening to this might not like this. This is stupid. This whole thing <laughs> is stupid. I think cryptocurrency in general or. I would think that the uh, more the, yes. stake would be less stupid. The more no, no, how... the, the the more I learn about it, and the the, the more I just think it's stupid. I think it was like <laughs> I, I think, think it's like, the good. I think it's like a way for it's just another way that the same group of people that made all the money in like the dot com thing, and then they made all their money on social media companies, and then it's the same group of people just making a bunch of money again. They just found a new way to do it. Oh, but this yep. time they're literally yeah. making money. I think the idea of it is really good, but how it's been implemented is really bad. You mean you don't you don't like you don't like the, the really bad drawings that people paid a lot of money for? <laughs> <laughs> like I think just I just yep. think this is all stupid. I understand the idea of the blockchain, but I think yeah, the way it's been the way it's being used is just stupid. It's just like a I don't know. It's just a way for like some some nerd to take all of everybody's money again, and like I feel like the I feel like the last thing we need is another cycle of some nerd taking everybody's money. Yeah, uh, I'm not entirely sure how you stop that though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is just this. I mean, to be fair, like and to be honest, like from the beginning, this was this was all just a way for like organized crime to avoid taxes at the beginning. <laughs> or they tried. It was in a. It's not always a good way of organ for organized crime to do stuff, but it was at the they beginning. They do somewhat get away with it. 
it took it took a while for people to catch up and that's you know i'm just saying this is stupid yeah i think this is stupid i know that uh people find it interesting i find it whatever the opposite of fascinating i think it's <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but i like your next story it's so moving on i'm gonna get that yawn out i don't know where that came from uh, my next next story streaming wins what do i mean by that well, for the first time ever, according to market measuring firm Nielsen, people watched more streaming services than cable TV. Uh, I feel like that's a long time coming. Or not. I feel like it should have happened a while ago. <laughs> I don't know. I have not watched cable TV in a really long time. I've cut the cable a long time ago. And uh, I'm surprised more people aren't doing this. But uh, broadcast TV has long since been taken over by streaming. So that's direct broadcast right over the air broadcast tv not a whole lot of people are like, doing that it's been taken over by streaming you need uh, like special antennas ago. for it now what was that you need like special antennas for it now it's it's not yeah fun i mean anymore. you have to have antennas and specialized antennas because it's a digital service over the air now you have to have a tv that can handle it um or a conversion or something like converter or something like that um but Besides that, you know, broadcast is overtaken. I, I do know some people, my parents basically who still do broadcast TV sometimes. But uh, this is the first time that cable TV was overtaken by streaming. And for num numbers wise, streaming accounted for 34.8% of viewing and cable TV was just 34.4%. So it's just barely overtook it. Broadcast, I think, is around 20%, and that still leaves some extra room for more, and I don't know what other people are watching, maybe DVDs, I don't know <laughs> what they count in this uh, for these services. Uh, but overall, we averaged, what was that, 190.9 billion minutes per week of streaming for, I think, the past year or so something like that we're really we're doing a lot of streaming uh part of the problem could be the lack of new content on cable tv so this oh, we just overtook cable tv with streaming but during the summer uh particularly the uh cable tends to reduce their new content it's just summertime uh, there's less stuff going on maybe they're actually making new content but it's not being released and uh, i believe it comes back in the fall Streaming, on the other hand, continually creates new content because the streaming wars have heated up and they're constantly competing for new eyeballs and are constantly making new uh, stuff. That's why streaming is so much better. Day streaming. Plus, uh, on the cable side, there's less sports programming going on right now, I think. I don't know. I don't pay attention to sports. But <laughs> cable is still sort of the, uh, the major sports viewing method people use so uh with with sports not not being as popular right now uh cable is seeing a lot less uh, viewership finally the total amount of tv viewership tv video viewing whatever all that uh, included all of that viewership has not really changed it's just that people are watching more streaming and the way that they're watching stuff has changed any comments questions i'd be curious to i was see gonna say it's probably uh it's probably a lot m more on the cable tv side when nfl when the nfl season is going on yeah um uh, yeah you know you're talking about sports and right now mlb that season is going on but nfl is in the off season right I'd be curious to see if the broadcast number has been going up a little bit lately, just because I know a lot of people, when they cut the cord, one of the things that they feel more comfortable cutting the cord is if they go get a digital antenna so that they can get live TV or whatever. Yeah, that's basically what my parents did. They, I think they've finally gotten rid of cable and they just do broadcast for certain things and then, then internet for everything else uh, for streaming stuff. Uh, and it seems to work pretty well for them. Oh, if you have a good signal, the picture from a digital yeah. digital antenna is like really good. Yeah, it is HD now. So yeah, 
It's like really good. Yeah. <laughs> Shockingly good, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all I got. I think it's all right. to HK. Yeah, I'll jump in here. And my first story is about Android 13. Android 13 came out a couple weeks ago, and it's rolling out to Pixel phones right now. Uh, and it should start rolling out to non-Pixel phones within like maybe a few months. Uh, Non-Pixel phones tend to get the update much later, but non-Pixel phones also tend to already have some of the features that that come in a new Android version. Uh, So some of the big new features that I want to highlight are Material U, which is the name of Google's... uh, third generation of mater- the material spec. The material spec is a, uh, is a specification for a UI system that uh, you know, kind of makes apps look a certain way. Uh, it gives like the colors and shapes of things uh, an overall conforming experience. Uh, so if you have the experience of like jumping from an iPhone to an Android and everything looks different, but it kind of still looks the same as the other stuff on the Android, that's because most things on Android use Material. Uh, and Material U, they took a focus on giving the user the ability to customize it, which is why they gave it the name Material U. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of Material, uh, which you would know if you've ever... Uh, looked at my GitHub page where I run one of the most popular Svelte uh, UI libraries called Svelte Material UI, uh, which is an implementation of the Material 2 spec. Uh, Hopefully one day it will also be Material 3. Uh, But uh, yeah, I'm happy to see Material 3 coming out on Android. Um, Another thing that iOS has had for a while, and I'm really happy to see Android get it, is giving apps access to only specific photos. Uh, Up until now, when an app has asked for access to your photos, you could either just say yes or no. Either yes, give it access to all of my photos, or no, don't give it access to any of my photos. But now with Android 13, you'll be able to say yes, give it access to photos, but only these photos which is uh, a very nice feature for security. Uh, Next feature is timed dark mode, which I know, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of the other other versions of Android on on other manufacturers' phones have had this feature. Uh, Basically, you can set it up so that during the day you're in light mode, everything is light colors, Uh, And at night, it switches over to dark mode, which especially if you use that in combination with something like night mode, which is a little different. Night mode will filter out blue light, so it'll kind of make everything look shifted red. Uh, Those in combination, you're going to have a great, enjoyable experience using your phone at night. Uh, So happy to see that coming too. Uh, next thing, which is going to be great for app developers, uh, specifically app developers of drawing apps is, uh, Android tablets, the Android system on Android tablets will now expose the difference between a touch coming from your fingertips and a touch coming from the stylus. Uh, so apps that, that require input from a stylus will now for sure be able to tell the difference between the stylus touching the screen and like the user resting their palm on the screen. So it makes things like palm rejection much easier to do. Uh, So I'm really happy to see that coming because I am a big fan of Krita on Android. If you are an Android user and you like to draw, definitely check out Krita. It is a really cool experience on Android. It's like a full desktop drawing experience just on Android. Can we get a uh, link to that in the note, show notes? Uh, yeah, I could totally put a link to that. Uh, let me jot it down. Uh, my last thing I want to talk about, last new feature, is apps now have to ask permission to send notifications. Before, when you installed an app, it would automatically have the permission to send you a notification, and you could deny it that permission, but it was opt-out. You know, you you had to specifically go in and deny it. 
Now it's opt in. When you install the application, it won't have permission to send you notifications until you explicitly allow it to, which that's another really, uh, really good thing to see on Android. I'm very happy to see all those changes. Uh, I can't wait to get it on my tablet, which is the Android device that I use that I like to draw on. So definitely very excited about that uh, stylus versus finger touch input feature. Uh, so that is it for Android 13. And uh, do you guys have any questions about that? Yeah, um, I have an Android phone. Uh, I have a, a Pixel phone, in fact, but I do not have Android 13. I'm disappointed. When am I going to get it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, they tend to roll out over like several weeks. So it okay. could just be that you're unlucky and you're going to get it in a week or two. Uh, or it could be you might get it at the very end, which could be maybe even like a month from now. Uh, but yeah, just keep looking for it. Uh, <laughs> I think you can go and download it uh, and install it yourself if okay. you really want to have it on there. But I'm not sure how to do that. You'd have to search for that online. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I had a couple couple updates came to it. And I'm like, oh, one of these is probably 13, but I actually went into the settings and verified that i'm still on 12 so <laughs> um, yeah you'd probably notice because 13 is uh like the material u is a pretty substantial change yeah i have a samsung galaxy s9 when am i gonna get it <laughs> uh likely never yeah that's, that's exactly it <laughs> <laughs> when you get a new phone maybe <laughs> yeah when you get a new phone <laughs> possibly depending on which new phone i get <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right, so I will move on to my next story, which is about an HTTP spec update that came out in 2015, and it introduced a new status code, and that status code is known as 451, unavailable for legal reasons. Uh, so this status code denotes that the server can't serve you a response because it is legally not allowed to. Uh, that could be for a number of reasons, but uh, one thing they note in the spec is that it doesn't mean that there is a response to give you and it just can't. It means that if there were a response to give you or not, it's not giving you that response because of legal reasons. Uh, and the number 451 is a reference to Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 book, which is about government censorship. Uh, and that, that number uh, comes from the, the temperature that books burn at. <laughs> so, Ordinary uh, book paper, which is not normal paper, right? It's really light kind of paper okay. that, yeah. that can bur burst into flames spontaneously yeah, so that, combust fairly easily so that's uh that is one of the main uses of 451 the 451 status code is government censorship uh if you are in a country whose government has decided that you cannot view certain content then what a server can do when you request that content is give you a 451 unavailable for legal reasons response uh and uh, some of the other uses are uh, if there are like contractual obligations, like you, the, the server is allowed to distribute content in certain regions of the world and not others. And if you live in one of those not others regions uh, and you request this content, you might see that, that response. Uh, and you would see it in the same way that you'd see like a 404 response uh i forgot i i didn't really go over the response codes so when you make a, a request to a website uh the server sends a response code along with a response and normally that response code will be something like 200 which is it just means okay and if you go to a website and you view the the web page you got a 200 response for sure uh, but some of the other codes that you'll see are uh, codes in the 400 range, uh, things like 403 unauthorized. If you haven't logged in, you might see that one. 
Uh, 404 not found. I'm sure we've all seen that one where the server can't find the thing that you're requesting. Uh, those error codes, the 400 series error codes, those mean that it was the user's fault. So like the server didn't do anything wrong. You did something wrong. Like you requested something without being authorized. Uh, and then there are also some 500 error codes. Those are the most common one is just like 500 internal server error. You might have seen that a lot. Uh, that's just kind of a generic like I messed up and can't give you what you asked for. Uh, some of the other ones in the 500 series are uh, like service unavailable. If if it's saying like I would normally be able to give you this, but I'm too hounded right now. Can you ask later? Uh, that's kind of what that status code means. So you might see these status codes uh, and your browser will present them to you in such a way that like it should give you the status code um, or at least it might give you like a web page that explains what went wrong. But if you see that status code 451 unavailable for, for legal reasons, now you know why. Uh, and then there's another reason that uh, a server might respond with that, which is if they refuse to comply with some sort of government regulation, something like GDPR. When the European Union enacted the GDPR, a lot of websites weren't ready to comply with that law. So what they did is they would just respond with a 451 error. So if you lived in the European Union at that time, you're likely pretty familiar with this response, with this error code. Uh, you know, because you would have seen this a lot. You ask for something from a website and the website responds 451, unavailable for legal reasons. Uh, so there are some other status codes that are very interesting. There's one called uh, 418, I'm a teapot. And that one was defined as, uh, as an April Fool's joke. Uh, which uh, it actually defined an entire spec for controlling a teapot over HTTP. <laughs> uh, but this one is not a joke. It did not come out on April Fool's and it's not a joke. It is a legitimate status code that you will see for legitimate reasons. Uh, and it's a little scary to think that like, you know, we're inventing status codes because of essentially government censorship. <laughs> Yeah, that's it for that. Any questions? Nope. Uh, <clears throat> I just remember I had to do something or another on my Squarespace site to comply with GDPR lest people get this error code. I forget what it was. Yep. Something about like the way the analytics were collected or something. I don't know. Was it the uh, the cookie thing that that now pops up on every single website? Some of them you can just click off of. Some of them you have to accept or... Or you have no other choice. <laughs> yeah, I just accept. I'm just like, screw it. You can have all my <laughs> you can you can have all my information. I am not that interesting to your little website. <laughs> I just open things in container tabs and then it doesn't matter if I accept it because that's the only website that'll see it. <laughs> so yeah, I don't really you have any questions that. there. I mean, that's pretty pretty cut and dry. I don't think I've ever seen it. I can't remember having seen it. Yeah, I'm not sure that I've ever seen it either, but I, I found it very interesting. I was looking at like RFCs and I noticed this HTTP RFC from 2015. Uh, and it's, it's a very fascinating, uh, fascinating subject. Yeah, I've definitely, well, I don't know if I've never actually seen it, but I definitely have not noticed it if I have seen it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that might be more. Uh, so yeah, over to you, Dave. Well, I was just going to say real quick that it might, you, you know what I mean? If you get an error, you might like, just be like, well, crap, I can't, I, maybe I typed it, you know what I mean? And just move on. You might not <laughs> yeah. actually notice that it wasn't a 404. So you, you're right. Oh, I may have seen it and just not cared yeah. or not noticed. So yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. So, um, I just got two stories here. Uh, one is you don't have to really worry about this. I just thought it was a funny story, specifically the YouTube video of Janet Jackson's rhythm nation can destroy some old hard drives. Uh, some component in it or something, <laughs> just the some resonant frequency that's a function of probably both the song and how it was specifically encoded, how the audio was specifically encoded for YouTube, and probably because it's an older song, so it was probably using some 
uh, some codec we either don't use very very much today or it was just compressed in a weird weird way and it just some old hard drives it just breaks them um if we lived in a better world i could break some people's hard drives right now by playing rhythm nation but i would like this podcast to continue being a podcast <laughs> and i have a feeling that uh that janet jackson's record label is probably the litigious uh type you don't have to worry about this if you're listening to this unless you're like on like a 20 year old like Dell laptop or something that you're still running because it still works with Linux and you're just like married to that piece of hardware. These are XP era machines and it's only certain, not just certain brands, but certain part numbers of hard drives that were affected by this. I'm presuming because they have a specific component in here that this particular frequency just breaks or knocks out of place or whatever. Uh, at first they thought it was a virus or that it might be a virus. But then they checked that by just playing it on a different computer, and it still still destroyed the hard drive of the the, of the computer. So it was it's not a virus; it's a physical problem. Um, I'd ask if there's any questions, but uh, does anybody have anything to say didn't about they, this? Didn't they find a fix for it or implement one that may still be around? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they just replaced the video. I think they uh, systems like. A lot of Windows systems, it filters out that specific <laughs> frequency, That's funny. and I think it's still there. Like it's like you can't play that specific frequency on a, a Windows computer anymore. I'm not sure. That's I amazing. Probably have some old hard drives that that might be susceptible <laughs> to this. I mean, if they'd have to be like under probably under 500 gigabytes or something. Like, oh, okay, it's. I think my the smallest one I have is 500 gigabytes, and it's from I think 2007. No, that's not even Windows XP era. That's Windows Seven era. Like you, these are old okay. drives. These are probably IDE, not SATA. Oh, okay, I do have some IDE drives actually. Well, great. Um, let's let's maybe sometime have a Rhythm Nation listening party. We'd have to run it. We'd have to run it off of a Linux computer because, like, the Windows computer will filter it out. The Linux computer is probably like FEO hard drive. <laughs> but another fix is just not to listen to this song, even though it is kind of a bop. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Rhythm Nation is kind of a bop, <laughs> and the whole album's pretty good. And uh, yeah, I suggest listening to Rhythm Nation. Just maybe do it from a CD or whatever, so that you don't destroy your grandmother's like old Dell or whatever. <laughs> and then uh, my, my next story, and I guess our last story for the week here is actually just kind of simply that uh, France is offering people 4,000 euros. It's around $4,000 right now. The euro to the dollar is uh, more or less one-to-one -to, -one, to get rid of their car and uh, get an e-bike. Um, This guy in this picture looks pretty happy on his e-bike. He looks very French. Yeah. And, um, He's in the countryside, and I guess you could get away with it on the countryside to some extent, but France, unlike the United States, is a fairly dense country. It's fairly small and fairly dense. Probably wouldn't work so well in the United States, uh, but I don't see any reason that the government shouldn't give people $4,000 to just ride a bike around instead of their car. We've tried, tried everything else to get... Uh, you get people going yeah. also not for nothing in France. There's good public transit, not just in the municipal sense, but if you want to go between cities, there's high speed rail there and whatnot. So it makes, just makes this all a lot easier. <clears throat> I know neither of you would get rid of your car for this, but if you lived in France, you might consider it. Yeah. I might I've, consider not even getting a car to begin with. Right. <laughs> um, if it was over there, um, I feel like if, if public transportation here was better, I would be more willing to give up my car. Yeah. Uh, you guys are also on the West Coast, which they do a lot for public transportation. Well, I don't know. They they don't have great, like, East Coast, like, Northeast in the United States have much better uh, public transportation within cities, and they even have, like, trains between cities. So you can, if you're in a big city on the East Coast, Northeast Coast, of the United States, you can get away without having a car. And I knew a lot of people who didn't have a car and just biked everywhere. I think Dave bikes everywhere though. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah, you can get like between Boston and New York and stuff. That's not high speed rail, but the trains, they no. go fair, they go fairly quickly and they're at a regular yeah. clip because people do commute, but maybe not daily commute, but there are people who 
work in Boston and also in, in New York city or also in, yeah. also in like the, the DC, like the DC Metro or something. And so yeah, yep. there's a, there's a really important Amtrak lines up there. It's yeah. different than here. Where I'm at in Florida, you'd die if you had, to, if you didn't have a car, <laughs> <laughs> it is really not built for, uh, other modes of transportation. No, in Florida, in Florida, live, live without a car. You need to be in like Miami. You might be able to yeah. get away with it in the Tampa area. And that's about it. Yeah. Couldn't probably. you just, couldn't you just ride your alligator everywhere? <laughs> that, that becomes it's not recommended. <laughs> becomes dangerous for other people that are maybe not riding an alligator that are just, at, just in the water. <laughs> it becomes dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, this this seems great for France. Um, good for them. And uh, like I said, the guy in the picture seemed real happy on that orange bicycle. I did have another question. I don't know if you have the answer, but do you know what they uh, consider an e-bike? Like, is, do you know what the rules are for that? Do you know what a velomobile is? And uh, um, does that do those count? You know, this article's from The Verge, so I doubt they got into the like the super <laughs> details of it. But I, I'd be yeah. willing to bet they're fairly flexible on that as far as like you could probably get a three wheeler or something if you wanted versus just a two wheeler yeah. or if you want one of the lay down bikes or whatever. Sure. I think they probably like draw the line at like, is this as big as a car? You know? <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are the, is there actually no benefit to you doing this? Yeah. But I, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're a practical sort there. So I, I couldn't tell you, but I, I just thought it was a cool story. Plus I like needed a story. And so I have a story. Right. Anyway. Well, I know like some, some towns, I don't know if here Gainesville, Florida counts or not. I, don't, I know for certain bike uh, trails, you can't have, if you have a bike that has, you know, a, an e-bike, it has to be a pedal assist. It can't be like purely electric. You can't, you have to pedal for it to move, but you can have like, you know, electric to assist your pedaling. Um, mm. to be, to be considered basically a bike for bike trails and stuff like that. So but that's isn't what I was that, wondering if it's something like that, if they had those kind of rules or what. Isn't that most e-bikes though, where it's got pedals and it is not, it's not all e-bikes. Um, but I think a lot of them do because there's a lot of rules, a lot of places like here where that, that rule is in effect in California. On the other hand, they kind of consider anything a bike if it, goes below 20 miles an hour if, even if it's a, you know electric even if you don't pedal or anything right hmm. um well then there's there have so. been definitely times that my bicycle is not a bicycle on those on the trails <laughs> <laughs> well they mean if it's not powered above 20 I, miles an yeah, hour i know i know <laughs> <laughs> if you end up going faster 20 miles an hour because you're going downhill <laughs> i've gone highway speeds on my bike yeah, I once went 50 miles per hour down a hill. Wow. Yeah, and I don't I, think I've ever made it that high. I'm terrified of doing anything like that now that I'm old. Yeah. Yes, I was not old at the time, and after I did it, I was like, holy shit, did I really just do that? <laughs> <laughs> like, I checked Strava, and it was like 49.7 miles per hour. Wow. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> That was crazy. <laughs> yeah, because at those speeds, if you fall down, you would be very lucky to to survive. Yeah. You don't really fall down so much at that speed as just you fall somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you fall across the ground. Right. Across the asphalt. Can't really tuck and roll or anything like that at that speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely foolish of me to do that, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got away from that without uh getting injured <laughs> yeah anyway matt you ready to read the show out oh is it that time i thought you had one more sh uh, story no but that's okay let me get to the the outro so thanks for uh listening watching if you're on uh, watching this on youtube and uh hanging out with us today whatever day that is that you actually saw this assuming again that we didn't accidentally delete the video and sound and all the, <laughs> the, the um, stuff for it. Please visit us at our website, echoplexmedia.com and check us out on Twitch. This show doesn't go out on live, but other shows from Echoplex Media is, are usually out live first and then recorded and, and put at other places. 
Uh, but you can find us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. And, of course, please give us money on Patreon. We do love that whole uh, money thing. And you can give money to us at patreon.com slash Echoplex. There's no media at the end. It's just Echoplex to confuse things. And to confuse things further, you can listen to our radio at eplex.xyz or through our website at echoplexmedia.com slash radio. You can find us on Twitter at yet another version of our name at eplexm. And finally, buy some of our sweet, sweet swag at echoplexmedia.com slash swag. I got my swag. It's on the way. I just got an email saying that it's uh, being chipped. Nice. That's all I got. Have a good one.